foreign, foreign relations meeting with President Bernardo Arevalo of Guatemala. An honor to have you here. Thank you for being here. It's an honor and thank you for having me here. I'm Michelle Caruso. Cabrera, Chief Executive Officer of MCC Productions and a CNBC contributor, and I will be presiding over today's discussion. We are joined both by CFR members here in person and also virtually. Um, this meeting is on the record. At 3.30, I'm going to open it up to uh, audience questions, but in the meantime, let's get started. So, Guatemala did not have an orderly transition to power when you were elected uh, and inaugurated earlier this year. The opposition tried very hard to prevent you from becoming president. President Biden uh, stepped in, uh, the US Congress stepped in, the OAS stepped in and called what was happening a coup d'etat. Finally, after a delayed inauguration where people were very nervous, you did become president of Guatemala. Congratulations. How, how secure do you feel about your hold uh, on the position and democracy and ruling under such a condition? Well, I feel secure because I know that we have the support of the people of Guatemala. But I am very aware of the fact that the corrupt minority that uh, attempted to derail the elections uh, has not, is still occupying uh, spaces of power. They still have control, for example, of the Attorney General's office. Uh, they are still actively trying to find ways into which they can uh, attack us, and they have not lost hope that at some point in time they succeed in you know, bringing us down and trying to have something of a comeback. Uh, we are very aware and so we are very attentive, but at the end of the day, we believe that uh, we are uh, in the middle of a process uh, that has led us to get control of the executive branch of power, that uh, we are having, as we speak, a process of election of judges uh, for the courts in Guatemala that is having uh, positive results, if not perfect, and that uh, at the end of the day, the, both the international and national environment uh, is going to make impossible an attempt to try to derail the process. So I'm not insecure, but I'm aware that people will try to keep uh, trying to bring us down. What are your priorities as president, and can you achieve them in this situation when you have so much opposition? Well, I think that our priorities are fundamentally about uh, proving, uh, letting people, giving them evidence that they were right. They were right by hoping that you can have a government that can govern without corruption, that can begin to use public money as it is supposed to, to be used, and that actually delivers in terms of development for the people. And so our goal is to produce evidence in roads, in schools, in support for, uh, for small entrepreneurs, uh, on new conditions in which indigenous populations actually can live and thrive. Uh, our task is to deliver, to deliver on what institutions are created to, to do. And in order to do so, we need to manage uh, the space politically and be aware that there's always going to be this corrupt minority that is going to continue attacking us in the process. When a lot of Americans think of Guatemala, they think of the thousands and thousands of Guatemalans who've come to the U.S. border, more than 200,000 last year, according to the uh, Border Patrol, in terms of encounters. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris has gone to Guatemala to try to attack the root causes of irregular migra migration from Guatemala and the rest of the, um, of the region. What are you doing mm -hmm. in order to try to reduce the level of irregular migration? We are working in two fronts. Uh, we need to work on the short time, uh, immediate term, 
in order to try to mitigate uh, some of the effects that we have of the fact that uh, the levels of poverty in our country are pushing people out of their villages and making them to look for work in, in different places. We are doing it in different ways. First of all, we are uh, very uh, strongly working in order to dismantle human trafficking networks that are also causing a lot of misery and pain to these populations as they move, try to move into the United States. And we are working together with the United States and with other countries like Canada, and we're discussing it now with countries in Europe, even with Mexico, uh, expanding programs for temporal uh, labor uh, so that we have uh, bigger contingents of people that can go uh, for six months or a year and then come back uh, to Guatemala with the possibility of returning again for another six months or a year. Uh, to work on different issues and uh, that's an important element and if you handle this in a way that it goes and happens in the towns which are identified as the ones that are expelling more people then they can have an effect. Uh, but that it's a short-term solution that it's only to going to mitigate a problem that will not cease to exist until you actually as you say tackle the root causes and the root causes is poverty and underdevelopment. It is not until the moment in which we actually begin to bring uh, decent livelihoods and dignified li livelihoods to these people that uh, migration is going to cease. People are going away not because they want to come to the United States and break from their families and, and you know, uproot themselves from their communities. Particularly what this is happening is in, in communities which are very tightly knit. Uh, and nevertheless, they do it because there, is, there are no economic alternatives. So our challenge, our task is to begin to provide paths into development so that these people can have jobs, they can become you know, uh, uh, small agricultural producers, they can have alternatives. And so many of our development programs are aimed precisely at the poorest regions in the country where you, uh, when you have the concentration of poverty, the concentration of indigenous population, where people are actually really coming out, walking out when they are 17, 16, because there is no future. And uh, investing in infrastructure for development in those places. The, one of the reasons people leave Guatemala, according to the Border Patrol when they interview them, is extortion by gangs and crime. What can be done about that, especially because we've seen what, for example, Nayib Bukele is doing in El Salvador, where he's imprisoned more than 1% of the population. He's been criticized for lack of due process, and yet he's become extremely popular because crime has gone down, and other people in the region seem to see that as a model. What do you think? Um, to, I think that what you're saying about people leaving out of fear of violence, etc., relates more to El Salvador and Honduras than to Guatemala. In the case of Guatemala, it's fundamentally about poverty. And uh, in our case, uh, the migration has poverty as the fundamental reason at the roots, and our uh, criminal landscape is different than the one that you have in El Salvador or in Honduras. Each country has its own criminal, I call it a landscape. It's uh, the, 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 the different types of uh, the profile of criminal activities that you have. Uh, the profile of criminal activity in El Salvador, for example, had uh, gangs as one of the fundamental reasons for crime and murder rates and so on. In Guatemala, it is different. They are a factor, but are not necessarily the biggest factor. And for example, for us, it is much more important organized crime and drug trafficking. And so uh, we need to actually design strategies that respond to our own criminal profile uh, and not necessarily begin to you know, bring solutions that are not, uh, that do not respond to our own problems. So we are engaging in this. We are working very strongly to, uh, to tackle narco-trafficking. We have captured in uh, 
this eight months five times more crocs than uh, the government previous government did in in in, in, in the last year uh, between capturing uh, uh, cocaine uh, in, in the ports to operating cocaine plantations and marijuana plantations and so on and so forth. Uh, we are engaging in a, in a very, very clear policy this time to gain control over uh, the jails because uh, the, the prison system was completely lost, was in the hands of the criminals. We are claiming it back. It is taking time that we are entering uh, prison by prison, claiming them back, reorganizing them, restructuring them, and we are working in expanding our police force. Uh, we have a, as a goal to have 12,000 new uh, policemen and women in the streets in our four years, so to get the level of uh, po police force per capita to the international standards, uh, because that's one of the reasons why you have a prevalence of crime. So we are tackling it from different angles. We highlighted at the, the top the, um, the disorderly transfer of power that happened in Guatemala, uh, a place where the transfer of power has not happened is Venezuela, uh, despite uh, overwhelming evidence that Maduro lost that election. What's your position on what, what should happen there and what Maduro should do? Uh, well, we have been very clear. We have we rejected uh, the results announced by the uh, elect National Electoral Council of Venezuela. We said that they were just not acceptable, that uh, they, they were not credible. Uh, we have stated very clearly that we reject uh, the declaration of Maduro as the winner and that we demand some sort of recount of the actas and excuse me i always forget how do you say actas in in english is the, the proof that came out of the ballot machines yeah, which show the voting uh, correct? yes of the of the ballot t stations mm -hmm. so uh either a recount by the actas by some sort of international actor that is agreed upon that is trusted and that then you can use that and count that or to have uh or to have new elections organized but in any case, we are very clearly rejecting uh, the current process as credible at all, and we are not recognizing Maduro as a president. As what needs to happen, I think that the international community needs to support Venezuelan actors uh, to try to find a way to uh, re either recount or go back to the ballots to have a solution. Is there anything more that can be done regionally with other presidents like you pushing harder or, or using some kind of leverage? Well, there, there are different efforts that are going on at the time. The presidents of uh, Brazil and uh, Colombia are engaged in, uh, or have been engaged, I don't know what has happened in, in, in the late days, in discussions with both uh, the regime and the opposition in Venezuela in order to try to find uh, a, a possible solution. Uh, and I think that pressure should continue from every side and possible sanctions that should be imposed in order to, to force non-democratic actors to actually uh, abide by the law. You're headed to the inauguration uh, next week in Mexico? Yes. For the new president, uh, where there's also been criticism what's been happening with the new election of the legislature uh, before Claudia Scheinbaum actually takes over. Uh, the election of judges, uh, which people feel will be very, very politicized, and also perhaps the undoing of independent agencies, which would then be a threat to Mexico's participation in the USMCA. Uh, are you going to speak with AMLO or Claudia Scheinbaum about these things or raise them? Or what, what, what do you think about that situation as we question the state of democracy in the Latin America? Well, no, it's not in my plan to bring the issue up. I know that there's a lot of debate. We have our own debate in terms of what should happen and how should the judges be elected. I know that there are differences around the world. There are countries in which judges are elected. 
I think that some judges in the United States are actually elected. Right here in New York uh, City. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I know that's one, one mechanism. We have judges elected by Congress. I don't know if that is the best way as well. Possibly, for example, I'm currently thinking uh, at the possibility of having uh, judges selected just uh, by a meritocratic, uh, meritocratic process, not elected politically. But I think that that is a question that should be answered by every country according to its own mechanisms and traditions and what works in one place not necessarily works in the other. You took a stand and said you were going to stand by Taiwan. Uh, a lot of countries in Latin America are being forced by China to make a choice, and, and you made yours. Uh, tell me about that experience. I understand you suffered economic coercion from China as a result. Why did you make that choice, and what do you hope uh, will come as a result? Well, we have been, uh, we made a decision that we're going to sustain uh, with the diplomatic relations with Taiwan, and we made it very clear from the very beginning that it, uh, that was going to be the situation because we knew that, you know, there was this uh, idea that we were going to immediately open relationships with the PRC, uh, and sometimes, well, we know that it was used in the context of the election, in order to attack us, you know, they were being accused of what not communists, and uh, so we made it very clear, and uh, and we have uh, kept our word. We told them as well that we believe that uh, what we need to do is actually get relations between Guatemala and Taiwan to a strategic level, one in which we see more investment and trade between our countries and not just exclusively cooperation. And uh, we are very glad that we are, uh, you know, in, have very good conversations with uh, Taiwan on exploring possibilities. We were discussing with you the fact that we, for example, uh, we are discussing both with Taiwan and with the United States the possibility that Guatemala uh, gains access uh, to CHIPS Act Fund, uh, considering the fact that we have an open and privileged uh, relationship with the United States. We have open access to the, its market, and we have a privileged relationship with Taiwan. So why not triangulate this relationship and uh, explore the possibility of uh, making uh, high-tech investments in Guatemala uh, with a view to export to the United States market? And so that's the type of conversations that we're having at this point. So just so I understand, so the same way that we have given subsidies to, say, Intel and uh, other chip companies, are you hoping that, that there will be subsidies provided to chip manufacturers to put manufacturing in Guatemala? Or what, no, play that out. no, that's a very good question. No, we're not looking for subsidies from the United States. Uh, the CHIPS Act has established a fund at the University of Arizona that is supposed to potential partner countries identify their path into, let's call it compliance. What we are is asking the US government to provide us access to those funds so that we can have assistance from the University of Arizona into charting our path into that type of compliance. Then it's a completely different matter because we believe that it's, uh, I mean, it's, if uh, this is going to happen, it's going to happen because we in the government are going to facilitate the investment, but the investment will be 100% private, international and national. We mentioned earlier that there had been co economic attempts at economic coercion by China. What did they do to you in the wake of Well, at some point, they, you know, uh, there was the inauguration of the new presidency in Taiwan, and we sent uh, our delegation, and then a couple of days afterward, afterwards, they blocked import of uh, some products into China, and, uh, and uh, that w that's what happened at the time. Uh, products like nuts and coffee and cardamom, and, uh, but so it's being solved. It's being solved. Is it solved, or is it being solved? Or? It's being solved. It's being solved. <laughs> <laughs> Very diplomatic. <laughs> um, you're fluent in Hebrew. Yes. You studied in Tel Aviv. Yes. 
Um, no, in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, excuse me. Um, you feel very close to Israel, do I understand that correctly? And um, I do. What, what would you do right now? I think that what the world needs is a ceasefire a complete release of the hostages, free access of uh, humanitarian assistance, and the beginning of some real international collective effort to establish a framework that enables the parties to seriously find a way into some sort of wo workable functional solution. I think that um, International actors have not really made the best efforts in the last 20, 30 years to try to get the actors to the table in a way that uh, enables a reasonable solution. And I think that uh, the current crisis, the tragedy that we're seeing, uh, the levels of suffering that we have there now make it evident that we should try to get back to the table and think of something that is workable or the cycle of uh, violence and despair in that region is going to continue uh, and grow. And I think that that is a danger, not only for the people living in the region, it is a danger for the world. When you call for a ceasefire, is that on condition first of the release of any remaining hostages or? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, 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 do you still believe in a two-state solution? I do believe in the two-state, I don't, I don't see any other solution. I believe in a two-state solution, and I think that uh, that that's what we, as an international community, should be striving for. The, pa the partition plan of 1947 is still valid; it needs to be adjusted, but the principles are the correct ones, and we need to try to abide by those principles and find the solutions of our time. You, before you were president, you were a diplomat. How do you achieve those things? I mean, they all sound. With Great. a lot of work, with a lot of imagination, and with a lot of determination. But we need, what we do need to have is real political will on the side of the international community to commit itself to our working uh, process. And sometimes that places, that generates questions internally for each of these countries. It's not an easy issue uh, for anybody. Uh, but if we don't tackle it seriously, uh, the level of suffering and the potential effect that that can have in the in, in peace around the world is, 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 is terrible. So we're headed toward the end of this section when we'll turn it to the audience, but let's wrap it up with more about Guatemala in particular. You're here in New York. You've met with investors while you're here. We are meeting, yes. We're starting actually today and the next two Two days, we're going, I'm going to be meeting different groups of investors. Wait, what's your elevator pitch? What are you telling them about <laughs> investing in, in Guatemala? Well, uh, come and grow with us and invest in a country that is rescuing its uh, democratic institutions, that it's investing in creating the conditions that you need for, uh, for investment, uh, rule of law, uh, infrastructure and uh, human development that has one of the best macroeconomic uh, indicators in the region and that has uh, open relationship uh, with the United States but it's also uh, the key to have access to markets not only in Guatemala but South Mexico and whole Central America and the Caribbean. Your macro environment is, at, is stable. Your currency has been stable for a very long time, uh, which would be very attractive to investors. I think the one concern they might have is when they look at, for example, Transparency International. You're ranked 154th out of 180 countries. On a scale of zero to 100, you only get a score of 23, with 100 being the best. Uh, so corruption, which is what you ran on and why you got elected. There you go. How do you, how do, how do you combat corruption? And, and what, what's going to be your, your measure of success, do you think? With corruption? Mm -hmm. uh, well, first of all, um, the first measure of success is by ensuring that executive branch of power conducts business transparently. And that's within our purview. That's what we can do. That's what can we assure. We are the ones that sign the contracts to build roads and public works and whatnot, and we are committing to that principle. 
Uh, and then we are, as I told, we are seeing very positive movement on the side of the process of election of new judges that give us hope that actually what is going to we're going to be witnessing in the next years is uh, is a process in which the the courts are going to claim back justice as the corrupt actors are being left out of uh, of their positions so Yes, that's our biggest weakness, but that's why we're, we, we were elected and that's what uh, we are here to change.